Okay, so we're going to start. Congress has the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. To promote progress, exclusive rights for limited times. When I was just beginning as a constitutional law professor, when I was a child, <laughs> I had this great faith in this process of constitutional adjudication. I thought that what we were doing was something about fidelity. I thought that what we could do as lawyers was to separate out the politics from the law here and push something strong when I was young. The fact that we are here asking the question about the constitutionalization of the public domain is an absurd fact. <laughs> an absurd fact because just take this text. What is the meaning of this text? If anything, this text says that the thing that's most clear about the public domain is that it is already constitutionalized. This text doesn't say Congress must pass a copyright act or create patents. Congress could choose to do that or not. All this text says that if Congress chooses to do that, it must do it for a limited time, which means it must preserve a public domain. Now, the fact that clear text, clear constitutional commands, is so obscure that when some of us began a case about three years ago trying to challenge the idea that the Mickey Mouse Protection Act was part of our constitutional law, that in fact you couldn't perpetually increase the term of copyright because it says, after all, limited times, and what the hell would that mean except that the public domain had to be protected? The fact that when we started this, people said, this was a crazy lawsuit. That's a reflection of the fact that we have moved so far from the conception the framers clearly gave us of the importance of the public domain that even clear text against the background of a clear constitutional history creates this obscurity in modern times that has yet led a court, though we have two clear judges who voted with us, to say that the Constitution means what it says. Now, this group, again, is important in this struggle, constitutionalizing the public domain. People on this panel have been doing that. Um, and uh, I'm grateful to those in the audience who are now participating in the, this very moment, filing amicus briefs to try to get the Supreme Court to take this case, Eldred versus Reno, Eldred versus Ashcroft. <laughs> By the time it decides, it'll be Eldred versus who knows who. Um, I, to get them to say what the Constitution meant, clearly, simply, embrace that idea. And if we fail here, we've already filed two other cases to bring this issue before the court, and we'll file a third within four months to raise this question of clear constitutional text. Now, I was attacked earlier by Evan, who said I was optimistic. And I take that charge very personally because <laughs> my brand is pessimism. But here, just puzzle about how it is that we get so far away from what, in an important sense, is an easy constitutional question to this world where serious people can stand up and say, of course, it's the conception of copyright law that it's perpetual and the public domain, as Jack Valenti would say, is this wasteland to be enclosed and shut down as quickly as possible. This panel is about that process. I'm happy to introduce the panel and welcome them to the conversation. Um, I'm sad that we have to have this conversation so late in a history begun by a constitution that should have put it off the table for all times. But the first presentation we make based on the founding paper by um, Yochai. So let me introduce Yochai. Thanks. Thanks. Um, OK, so uh, talk a little bit about the Constitutional Foundation of the Public Domain. Um, <clears throat> I want to very quickly go over a claim about uh, the system that we actually have as involving two-tiered review. Uh, 
I want to spend most of the time talking about normative justification for such an unusually tight system of judicial review as I believe we have, uh, largely focusing on democracy and autonomy. The paper also talks about uh, uh, this being an institutional check because of the skewed political economy of uh, uh, intellectual property legislation to wit, those who gain the benefits see them as private and concentrated, those who pay the costs are largely diffuse and see them as external. Uh, classic case to have someone actually provide a review uh, 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 of that. Uh, and I'm not going to say anything more about that. Uh, I think it's fairly straightforward and it's in the paper. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to go through some pressure points that I see today on uh, both the doctrinal uh, claim and the uh, uh, more important and, and the normative uh, 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 question. Okay, so uh, the two tier judicial review. Uh, system uh, includes the exclusive rights clause and the First Amendment. Uh, exclusive rights clause based on cases uh, from over a hundred uh, uh, for over a hundred years uh, requires uh, uh, and this is and this is uh, 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 things uh, 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 Mala Pollock has written about, David Lang's written about, uh, 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 others uh, 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 have written about. Uh, is uh, uh, you look at it if if. Uh, the quotation in our in our materials from Graham v. John Deere uh, pretty much lays it out. Uh, originality uh, has to be original, has to add to the stock of knowledge, and must not remove from the public domain. Uh, I see this largely as a threshold inquiry, not one that goes necessarily into the very details. But the bite would be in a case like Eldred that uh, if uh, uh, material that is created and is known to be in the public domain at a certain point, given a certain time, taking it out is, as a threshold matter, unconstitutional. We don't care about the specific uh, uh, balancing, or at least there has to be a plausible, and assuming it's not taking out of the public domain, there has to at least be some plausible claim that it enhances, uh, uh, that it enhances the uh, uh, creation of new knowledge which the retroactive uh, com extension component of the uh, 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 Copyright Term Extension Act doesn't do. So this is a le at a level of, of threshold analysis, no balancing. You have to do these things, otherwise you're gone. Uh, usually, uh, 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 once something has uh, passed this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, test, is it's usually uh, appropriate. But then we have uh, more contextual review through the First Amendment, uh, and this uh, uh, I'm suggesting is is largely along the Turner lines, uh, 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 Turner Broadcasting, in terms of having to serve an important governmental interest and be no more restrictive than necessary. Uh, the two-tier system applies to anything that's functionally an exclusive right, whether or not it's formally an exclusive right, and this comes uh, into play in the database protection uh, uh, law uh, that functions as an exclusive right and ought to be under this and therefore fails under the threshold test, uh, doesn't even get to the First Amendment. Uh, and the First Amendment, in any event, applies whenever you get a, uh, 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 a right that constrains the use of information, even when it's done in the interest of uh, some speech-enhancing purpose, like copyright or, in the case of trademark, like trademark. So that's the, that's the, that's the basic uh, structure, and I make the doctrinal claims based on the cases, and I won't go into that now. Uh, what I'd like to do instead is focus a little bit more on why it is that we would have such a system of uh, tiered review with both a threshold test and a more fact-intensive test. Uh, and, and those, uh, as I say, largely I'll talk in terms of democracy and in terms of uh, autonomy. However, there is a descriptive claim that precedes the normative analysis. And the descriptive claim is exclusive rights differentially affect different speakers. And so a direct consequence of an exclusive rights system is to prefer some kinds of speakers over others. And more specifically, it's to prefer commercial producers who directly appropriate what they say by relying on intellectual property at the expense of those who do not. Concentration, because once you own an inventory, it becomes substantially cheaper for you to produce new things than if you don't own an inventory, so you get systematic concentration. Uh, 
and homogenization in the sense that uh, uh, a Disney employee will work with Mickey and Goofy and a Time Warner employee will work with Bugs and Daffy, even though the inspiration captures the one that they could do something interesting with Mickey at the same time. So you get an internal homogenization of use of the same resources. If you're interested in, in, in this in more detail, it's not in this paper and it's not in the paper in the morning, but it's in, in a different paper that will come out in a few months. Um, the public domain is particularly valuable for two kinds of speakers uh, that we uh, have seen different versions of them uh, in the past couple of days. Uh, professional, nonprofit, uh, uh, and civic speech situations. So science, um, the activists that were here over lunch, uh, all of us, uh, and a variety of other uh, civic groups. Those are the kinds of speakers that are not helped but are harmed, uh, as well as peer production, what we talked about uh, this morning. That is hurt by strong enclosure and helped by the public domain. Which means that when you analyze in terms of democracy uh, the th and, and of autonomy, the thing to think about is what are the differential effects of having commercial, concentrated, relatively homogenized production of information and culture in a society versus having a much stronger domain of nonprofit as well as radically decentralized peer production of information and culture. Um, so the argument from democracy uh, uh, falls into um, uh, thanks. the argument from democracy falls into uh, a category of what I would think of as political democratic discourse. These are the things we see in political economy of media study as the critique of commercialization of commercialized and concentrated media. We think of this to some extent as the Berlusconi effect, or now we'll have the Bloomberg effect. Uh, though I'm not sure that those are in any way really related. It really is more the Berlusconi effect of media having too much actual power. There's also the homogenizing, th there's also the lowest common denominator effect, not having uh, uh, a rich uh, uh, public discourse because you have few and commercial producers. Um, the other thing to understand is that as we get to the point, which we may or may not because of a variety of, of political debates that we've been talking about in the past, couple of days, and in particular this morning, uh, that Larry was talking about. Uh, uh, if the physical layer uh, and the logical layer get opened up, control over the content layer becomes the central point of concentration to replicate all of these effects. Similarly, if the logical layer through copyright and DMCA uh, and USITA is locked up, that becomes the focus of control for replicating the, the same concentration that we had from the one cable system or the three broadcasters. Um, there are also positive political economy feedbacks. In other words, those who are strong will get stronger through law and legislate the market so that it fits them. We saw an example of that yesterday. Uh, and what sort of democracy are we talking about? We're talking about democracy that values engaged discourse, we're talking about democracy that might, might value engaged discourse at a very local level, small groups with a lot of conversations on their lists, on their websites, small communities. Being able to create community is something that would fall well under a, plur uh, a, a pluralistic conception of democracy where what you care about are smaller groups, uh, as well as something that's more general potentially in terms of an open conversation in society without anyone holding choke points that would be on a, on a what, what I would think of as a vaguely Habermasian conception uh, of focusing on the quality of discourse and the equality and the capacity to speak as central to democracy. Now, by the way, uh, slight side note. We are talking a lot about uh, the United States. We're talking about, about the First Amendment. We're talking a lot about Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8. We've heard a little bit of it's not all about the US. Part of the idea of expressing these political values at this level is that I don't think that these are uniquely American values. And so the idea is to abstract from what it is that is our discussion to something that we can speak of in terms of human rights generally and in terms of democracy generally, and I think that's an important thing to do. Um, so, conceptions of democracy, and in the paper I go into some quibbles more or less with uh, 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 Cass Sunstein's claims that we are gonna get complete uh, uh, wide 
dispersion of, of, uh, of, of uh, focus, uh, uh, and therefore we're not going to get engaged discourse and the questions of how much, in fact, we gain from having a small number of commercial concentrated producers producing the agenda relative to how much we lose in terms of the richness and diversity of public discourse. Um, another dimension, Terry Fisher has been calling this semiotic democracy, uh, uh, meaning making, uh, 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 democracy and meaning making power. Rosemary Kuhn wrote about this a decade ago. Uh, uh, Neva Elkin, uh, 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 my, uh, uh, Michael Maddow, uh, Keith Aoki, Jamie, I mean, a lot of people here have written about the idea of distributing widely and decentralizing the power to make meaning in a society as a dimension of participating in its common culture, as a dimension of its politics through its symbolic statements. Uh, and of course, this is an important dimension. Um, <clears throat> So again, these are in a sense the two dimensions of democracy that I think are affected by whether or not we have a system that preserves a robust, open component that permits a rich, non-profit and radically decentralized peer-based information and cultural production system, or one that increasingly is aimed to refine the control of the commercial concentrated uh, 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 information and cultural producers over the information flows in society. A similar concern mirroring it occurs at the level of autonomy. Uh, there are two types of things, autonomy and concentration, and more specifically autonomy and peer production. Uh, with regard to concentration, imagine the condition where you, the only screen you have into the world is controlled by AOL, Time Warner over a cable medium, the opportunities for the company to structure your understanding of the options open for you in life and the potential valuation of them is tremendous. When you have a legal system choosing to set up a situation where an AOL time warner control over the only window into the world, that law violates autonomy. <laughs> Uh, as well as, again, the, 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 the variety of viewpoints. More narrowly, and this actually, this actually applies across a wide domain of conceptions of autonomy uh, uh, and how they, uh, uh, not only strong positive autonomy or descriptive autonomy, but even conceptions of formal, uh, uh, formal conceptions of autonomy would feel reasonably comfortable with saying a law that increases the diversity of viewpoints and decreases opportunities for one person to manipulate the information environment from within, from within which another chooses is preferable to one that creates such opportunities. There are more uh, specific uh, autonomy-related issues with peer production, primarily captured under this notion of <clears throat> consumers to users and employees to peers. The notion that larger chunks of one's day are not built around following orders. Larger chunks of one day one of one's day are not followed, uh, do not get carried on by selection from a menu that is set by another, but that one has a greater role in selecting the, in, in selecting the menu of things one is, can do and in not following orders. Pressure points, doctrinal stability, I suggested this is doctrinally, uh, this is uh, uh, in the doctrine, some might disagree, and there are some debates about it, <laughs> as Larry knows well. Uh, primarily, I want to talk for uh, a minute about the moral inversion of the First Amendment. Uh, the First Amendment is a human right, and it is being used in exactly the opposite way. It is being used to protect corporations from regulation, such that the DC Circuit will sit down and say, the FCC's horizontal and vertical ownership rules don't quite fit our understanding of the probabilities of collusion between cable operators, therefore they are unconstitutional. Footnote C. Turner. The same, a panel of the same court will say, copyright? You mean Eldred is told by law that he can't publish what he wants? What's that got to do with the First Amendment? Uh, that's inverted because it is a human right 
It is about human beings, and to the extent that it is about corporations, it is always and only derivative and instrumental. Private ordering, we talked about USITA, we talked about this notion of one has no exclusive right to the work of, to exploit the work of another. When the mechanism for control over information that a government law imposes is to give a private right, this confuses everyone no end and ends up with such things as Denver Area Educational Telecommunications Consortium where on one hand it was okay to let uh, private cable carriers prohibit smut that the government couldn't pro uh, uh, prohibit by eliminating them from cable access channels, but from peg access channel, public access and governmental channels, the same cable operators were treated as private censors and the government shouldn't give them extra power. So there's tremendous confusion once the, once the form of the government regulation is understood as private ordering and this will be a, play a tremendously important role not only in copyright but particularly in understanding USITA and its limitations uh, constitutionally uh, and it'll confound the debate I believe. Um, there's a question we won't go into here, but uh, uh, I go into there. What do we do about software as speech? What do we do about how do we understand the question of the constitutional constraints on regulation of the logical layer? One option is just to assimilate to the intermediate scrutiny, just to talk about the effects on users and have a parallel analysis to what we see with copyright. The other is to say, Ed Felton can't publish in the language of his publication. He can't use the equations that a mathematician would have that would be equivalent to him in computer science. Dmitry Sklarov cannot, represent, cannot present his work because he's in prison, or at least not anymore. Now he's just waiting to see whether he'll sit in prison for 25 years. Um, at which point you're talking about strict scrutiny because it's regulation of a professional language. Very thorny issue. I try to, to suggest some directions uh, uh, in the paper, but one we'll have to deal with. Criminalization. So, uh, Dmitry Sklarov sitting in. The idea that end-to-end -end control in order to preserve the business model includes the human endpoints. And you control the human endpoints by fear through criminal law. This is how we do it normally, but it presents a tremendous chilling effect when the law is one that is about controlling cultural production, even if it is for the public good. And Jessica uh, uh, Littman, when she spoke about free speech, was saw that the direction was to control the human endpoints necessarily. Uh, and finally, we get to raw information and information about information, so the database legislation and how that will play out. Uh, as well as uh, linking, and this again is part of Ramirez, just like the, the logical layer materials were part of Ramirez. Uh, and the basic point with regard to linking is there is information out there. Someone wants to prevent someone else from getting that information, and they are seeking the request, they are seeking the aid of law to prevent someone else from removing that control of the information by doing one thing, saying where the information is or can be found. And that's another dimension that I think will be very, very important. So these are the pressure points I see today. My name is Jeff Powell, and I have laryngitis. So I will try to be mercifully brief on both you and me. Professor Binkler's paper is an admirable contribution to the question of how to relate the current state of the public domain with the current state of constitutional law. It combines both tight reasoning and a kind of passion that seems to me appropriate for the topic. All I want to do is to add a couple of footnotes that raise questions I found myself asking as I read the paper. Uh, bear with me, both in terms of my croaking and as I try to set up 
the footnotes. I'll tell you when I get to the footnotes. Um, let me begin by quoting a couple of statements that Professor Binkler makes on page 213 in which he's summarizing his argument. The systematic bias built into the legislative process justifies a constitutional framework such as the one the Supreme Court has developed over the past century. And second, because too extensive a definition of rights is economically inefficient and harms both democracy and autonomy, it is the role of the courts to serve as a backstop to this political economy to prevent the systematic and excessive expansion of exclusive rights. I want to put aside economic efficiency for the time being, indeed for all of my time. Um, notice the logic of Professor Binkler's reasoning. Number one, certain features of the information system we have and of our political system have systemic outcomes that, number two, are harmful to democracy and autonomy. Number three, courts can do something about it. They can provide a valuable backstop or correction. And number four, this role that courts can play justifies the current framework of judicial doctrine, or because Professor Binkler is politer, perhaps, to the court than it deserves, um, what Professor Binkler can make of the current state of constitutional doctrine. Now, every step in this reasoning is carefully argued, and I'm deeply sympathetic with the first three steps. Um, in fact, I want to agree with the whole thing, but as I read, I find myself wondering how persuasive Professor Binkler would be to someone who is less eager to agree with him. At certain crucial points in this line of reasoning that I've just outlined to you, Professor Binkler's reasoning depends on matters of political and social theory, economics, and moral philosophy that are hotly contested, to say the least. Let me give you an example. Take the second step in the argument, the harm he perceives to democracy and autonomy. That step depends, Professor Binkler uh, recognizes full well, on what one means by democracy and autonomy, and furthermore, on what social and moral value one places on whatever one means by those concepts. Professor Binkler, therefore, uh, by, besides acknowledging this, addresses these questions of definition and evaluation. He clearly has very reasonable views on both matters, what democracy is and why it's a good thing, what autonomy is and why it's a good thing. But, as he handsomely acknowledges, there is more than one game in, the ta in town on both of those matters. Democracy and autonomy are now self-defining and their value, however you define them, is not self-defining. I am quite sure that the numerous defenders of the current protectionist impulse in intellectual property law would have a lot to say for their part about the pro-democracy and pro-autonomy consequences of protectionism. Now, at this point, Professor Binkler may well be thinking to himself, so what? If this were an area in which there were no disagreements, it would not be very interesting. Fair enough. But now I can get to my two footnotes. Number one, footnote one, it's vitally important for those who are concerned about the constriction and shrinkage of the public domain not to find ourselves locked in an insular conversation. I am not suggesting that anybody here has done that, but it's easy to do. Let me say a, a word about why, what the, the danger I see. As you read an argument like Professor Binkler's, you are struck, as he himself points out, by pressure points. In particular, I'm struck by the how essential it is, how crucial it is for the argument to work for one to make an attractive case for the core concepts on which it, uh, in which it turns. 
if you're going to defend or advance constitutional concern over the public domain along theoretical lines of the sort that Professor Binkler proposes, you're going to put enormous pressure on the concepts of democracy and autonomy with which you're working. And the persuasiveness of your constitutional conclusions is going to depend on how attractive and persuasive those concepts are in themselves. Now that brings me to my second footnote. I wonder whether there's at least some possibility that we are not collectively giving up too soon on the possibility of finding an answer to the problem we perceive in constitutional law. What do I mean? I mean, in one very real and important sense, Professor Binkler's paper is all about law. His goal is to show the reader how a certain reading of current Supreme Court doctrine can serve the interests of what he perceives as democracy and autonomy. But note, that is fundamentally an external justification for his reading of doctrine. Uh, indeed, as he clearly, clearly intimates, among other places on page 215, um, the doctrinal and the normative moves in Professor Binkler's reasoning are separate and distinct. Now, it may well be true that the internal reasonings and justifications of the law are inadequate to ground a constitutional regime that is strongly protective of the public domain. That may be correct. Uh, a lot of co contemporary constitutional law scholarship suggests that the internal reasonings of the law are inadequate to ground much of anything. Well, that may be so, as I say. But if it's so, notice what we've given up. We have given up on Holmes's famous assertion in his Lochner dissent that a constitution is made for people of fundamentally differing views. We all share, willy-nilly, whether we like it or not, the constitution. We are perhaps not in this room, although I'm not sure about that either, we are deeply divided over what we mean by democracy, over what we mean by autonomy, and about why and if we value those concepts. Well, where would we turn if we were to decide to try one little more time to find within the law itself the resources for the protection of the public domain? You will be relieved to know that I will not subject you to even the sketch of an answer, but I will give you a hint. What about, uh, this is much in the spirit of Professor Lessig's comments, what about revisiting the argument, forever associated with the name of Justice Black, that we should read the First Amendment, or at least read the First Amendment more or less as it is written. <clears throat> Congress shall make no law. Suppose abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Suppose we read that as if it meant Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. An interesting thought. <clears throat> now, of course, we all know that blacks' absolutism can't be done. It's unworkable. It's got all kinds of logical and intellectual problems. It also doesn't sound sophisticated. I'm not sure that it can't be done myself. I'm not sure that you can't find a way within the internal reasonings of the law itself to give a meaning to those words, or rather, better, to find the meaning in those words and to apply that in a fashion that is con coherent, consistent, and, uh, and, among other things, protective of the public domain in my suspicion. Uh, some of the most exciting First Amendment scholarship today I think immediately of my co-panelist, Jed Rubenfeld, in his recent article on the First Amendment's purpose. Some of the most interesting recent scholarship is rich with suggestions about how one might discover in the words of the First Amendment and within the internal justifications of the law a meaning and a richness that would address, among other things, the problem that this conference is centrally concerned with. Now. I close. No doubt it would be a bad idea 
if everyone concerned about the public domain tried to do the same thing. If all of us were to direct our intellectual efforts in the same direction, it will be, I think, a very good thing if some of us, at least, direct more of our attention to specifically legal answers to the problem. Thank you. So I apologize. That's Jeff Powell uh, <laughs> from Duke University. And, and now uh, Jeb Rubenfeld from Yale University will address the same question. Thanks, Larry. Um, we knew we were in trouble in the uh, wind done gone litigation. Some of you probably know I was uh, representing Alice Randall, the um, the author of uh, the uh, the novel. We knew we were in trouble first when uh, at the end of uh, at the end of the first major hearing before the district judge, he hadn't said a word. Certain arguments had been presented at the end of the hearing. He just picked up the copy of the manuscript of The Wind Done Gone, and he looked out and he said, you killed Scarlet. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, seemed like, it seemed like there was going to be a little problem with the... Uh, <laughs> but you know, the, um, the Wind Done Gone, is, it's too easy a case. It's, in a way, it's too easy a case for the, um, for the First Amendment. Uh, in the, the brief that, that Yochai Benkler and I wrote, um, uh, that was submitted uh, before the appellate court. It was a short brief, a simple brief, that said, uh, you have to remember the, the prayer for relief in that case demanded the, the impoundment of every copy that had been printed of this book and the burning, and the burning of those copies. And the brief said that we don't burn books in this country, do we? We don't suppress books that criticize the accuracy and morality of a reigning cultural narrative. We don't suppress such books in this country, do we? Not under our First Amendment. That's a prior restraint. There, I hadn't said a word about copyright yet. I said in a, in a little paragraph, should the work be judged to be in, an infringement of the copyright and not a fair use? Well, then damages can be allotted later. This is a prior restraint, end of story. When the publisher, Alice, was not a party to the case, as, as you may know, when the publisher, who was the party to the case, saw this brief, the publisher's response was, you killed our copyright defense. <laughs> and that's uh, a little, may help in, in understanding the, the legal politics of why the confrontation between copyright and, and First Amendment remains as relatively suppressed in the case law as it, as it is. Now, I'm not here to uh, try to kill copyright. I am, I, I, I do think, however, that it's time to interrogate copyright, interrogate it at the bar of the First Amendment. And I want to say a word just briefly about what it means to take a constitutional perspective on copyright law. What does it mean for you all, if you were to do so, to take a constitutional perspective? And here I'm I'm actually very sympathetic. I'm going to join in the, some of the uh, uh, latter remarks that uh, Jeff Powell was just saying. And I'm going to differ a little bit with something Yochai said. Yesterday, Rosemary Toombs reminded us that there is something parochial and distinctly American about the freedom of speech, that it's not the same as embracing the language of international human rights. That's right. I think that's right. There is something distinct about the history and the law, uh, American constitutional history, about American constitutional law, American constitutional values that lies behind the freedom of speech, which is not identical to, for example, the language of, of human rights and international human rights. If Congress were to pass a law in this country that said that people could not put in movies certain depictions or representations of medicine men because of and to the extent that it harmed Native American cultures, that would be unconstitutional. It wouldn't matter that it might really harm Native American cultures and the attempt to vest Native American cultures with an exclusive right over depictions of medicine men 
in my opinion, not even a close call, just not constitutional. So we are, um, uh, to take a constitutional perspective is to, em is to um, uh, embrace um, a certain perspective of fundamental values, but it's not necessarily the fundamental values that some of you may want. You could look at constitutional perspective on copyright in one of two ways, just instrumental. This, we, we may introduce you, if, some, if you aren't familiar with it, to a set of arguments which maybe you can use to achieve certain goals. Or perhaps um, um, uh, uh, it's a question of fundamental values. Of, 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 uh, uh, but if it is, as I think it is, they may not be uh, necessarily the fundamental values that you are interested most in uh, serving. But I do think that the important thing is to begin here uh, um, uh, with a starting point that takes nothing for granted. It should be viewed as a mystery still to be explained why David Lang cannot, if he cannot, read a poem to us without fear of doing something unlawful. How can that be under the First Amendment? We have to start with a position that takes nothing for granted. Not because there's any real possibility that US law is going to recognize copyright as one gigantic exercise in unconstitutionality. No, but because we can't begin to understand the confrontation between copyright and the First Amendment, a confrontation which still has not taken place, which, which may be coming to a head, but may not be in the case law, at least it's, it's hard to know if it will. We can't begin to understand that until we have a much better, much clearer, much deeper answer to the question of how it could be that a district court in 2001 could actually think that he could burn a book that attacked a reigning cultural historical narrative without violating the Constitution. How can that be? Well, there have been essentially three different principal explanations of why copyright does not present a First Amendment problem. I'll probably leave some stuff out here, but just for simplicity, we could label these explanations. One, formalist. Two, doctrinalist. And three, law and economist. Each of these three approaches is going to be familiar to you, I'm sure, but none, I'll try briefly to suggest, is uh, remotely satisfactory. So the formalist says that uh, copyright and the freedom of speech are not at odds at all because the two fields are conceptually distinct. The First Amendment protects ideas. Copyright does not protect ideas. Copyright lawyers know how difficult to implement the idea expression distinction is. But let's suppose, let's grant arguendo that we can make sense of this distinction, that it exists. We could operationalize it. It remains completely unsatisfactory as an account of why there's no First Amendment problem. Now, why do I say that? The reason is simple. You, most of you probably know the famous Cohen case, the case in which the Supreme Court overturned the conviction of a man um, uh, who wore a jacket with the words, fuck the draft, on the back. Well, the idea expression distinction is critical to that case, it plays a critical role. The government's position in every case like that is we wouldn't dream of suppressing the idea. It's only the particular expression, only the form of words that were used. And formalistically, that claim is perfectly plausible. Cohen remained free, didn't need to express his anti-draft ideas. He could have expressed it a million different ways. The idea expression distinction, if taken seriously in First Amendment law, if it were really a part of our First Amendment law, would put Cohen in jail. And it would also ban banish art altogether from First Amendment protection, but I won't go into that. In other words, First Amendment law has already clearly and emphatically rejected the idea expression distinction. Government cannot evade the First Amendment by regulating only the manner of expression only the form of words used. And the reason given by the Cohen court was precisely that the manner of expression, the particular form of words used, can be central to First Amendment freedom because of the special expressive and emotive power that may be possessed by particular forms of expressing an idea. So much then for the idea expression distinction as a way of making copyright unanswerable to the First Amendment. The second answer is doctrinalist. This is the fair use answer. Copyright takes care of First Amendment problems through the doctrine of fair use. At worst, this thought cashes out into a completely compromised and degraded idea of what the First Amendment might require. But even at best, even in its best rendition, and I think the best rendition is pointed to in, in David Lang's typically brilliant and elegant paper from yesterday, even then, the fair use idea can't serve, I don't think, 
that do away with copyright's basic First Amendment problem. The reason is that the First Amendment is not about fairness. Not even when fairness has been reconceptualized, as, as David Wood, into the language of community practices, which is uh, better than the language of monetary fairness to the copyright holder. Imagine that the police came in and, and stormed our, our, our little conference here and arrested us all under a statute that prohibited criticizing copyright law. Well, that's unconstitutional, right? Does it become less unconstitutional if it has a proviso, if the law has a proviso, unless our criticism is fair? No. No fair use exception could save such a statute unless the fair use exception were interpreted in a way to obliterate the statute entirely. <laughs> and that conclusion doesn't depend on any special First Amendment value attached to criticism of existing law. A statute prohibiting pornography, or to use Jamie Boyle's example, rhyming political theory. A statute prohibiting rhyming political theory would not become constitutional if it added unless it was fair, unless there was a fair use of it. Free speech and fair speech are not interchangeable concepts. On the contrary, they are in many ways at war. The third and final approach to the problem of copyrights, let me just add a note on that. The fair use exception may be constitutionally mandated, it may be constitutionally necessary within a copyright regime, but it's not sufficient. It doesn't tell us what the basic reason why copyright is constitutional. It doesn't give us that reason, nor does it help us understand what basic scope of copyright laws could be constitutional if there is a fair use exception. Now, the third and final approach is the, the law and economists approach. And this economistic paradigm is getting pretty close to being the ruling paradigm uh, 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 among intellectual property scholars today. I, uh, maybe it just is the ruling paradigm. It's especially dangerous because of its appeal to both left and right, the right for the usual reasons, the left because this economic language seemed to provide a, a cornucopia of arguments about why current copyright protection was overly protective. It became appealing to the left to use that argument against the uh, the um, uh, extensions of copyright law. At any rate, the economistic approach is simple to state. Copyright is legitimate under the First Amendment, the law and economist says, precisely because and precisely to the extent that it provides the right ex ante investment incentives to produce more speech, to optimize speech production, ex post, to be sure. Copyright laws suppress speech, but ex ante, you see, if you get the incentives right, they'll produce more speech, and that's why it, that, that solves the First Amendment problem. You can find this argument in the literature. It's no First Amendment problem because copyright law, if structured properly, gives you more speech. And one of the chief appeals of this uh, paradigm is that it weaves together the policy uh, uh, and functional analysis behind copyright with the constitutional analysis. If copyright's underprotective, there will be less speech. If it's overprotective, there will be less speech. The policy analysis is the First Amendment analysis. Well, that, that's a problem. When, when you have identified, when you've equated policy analysis with constitutional analysis, you can be sure you, you got something wrong. And that's not just because judges cannot be pictured as being able to do the incredibly complicated empirical analysis guided by the highest tech economic models that would be necessary to decide whether the copyright statute's got the incentives right. It's because, once again, the ideal of free speech here is not the right one. Consider again the Cohen case. The state's lawyers read the latest literature on copyright law. They say, oh, the statute's constitutional after all because prohibiting bad, uncivil words actually produces more speech overall. Nasty, bad words actually cause some people to retreat from the public dialogue. Well, that's an empirical claim. It might be true. In fact, it's similar to the argument that some people have made against hate speech and pornography. It's silencing. And it might be in that sense. It's an empirical claim. Could be true. Come to think of it, maybe a brilliant argument, a knockdown argument. It's also silencing, producing on the whole less speech rather than more. <laughs> so we can't be thrown in jail for unfairly criticizing copyright law, I said a moment ago. So we, are we to understand that we could be thrown in jail for making too good an argument against <laughs> copyright law, so good that it brought the debate to an end, leaving the audience with nothing to say? <laughs> Free speech analysis, I don't think, works that way. I don't think it works that way. We don't let government defend a content-based prohibition on speech on the ground that the suppression will, on the whole, produce a better, more optimal speech market. Which is simply to say the First Amendment's objective is not maximization of speech production. It is certainly not the achievement of an efficient speech market, i.e., generating exactly as much speech as people are willing to pay for. The policy or functional objective behind copyright law, which if we take the text of Article 1 seriously, 
could be said to be the promotion of useful arts, is not the First Amendment's objective. Just as uh, free speech and fair speech are not equatable, neither can free speech be reduced to, to cost-effective or efficient speech. The Constitution cannot be economized in that way. So I would urge everyone here, everyone interested in the constitutional dimensions of copyright, to break out of this, uh, uh, at all costs, of this cost-benefit paradigm. Your real concerns at the level of fundamental values are not with efficiency. Perhaps your concerns are with distribution, with egalitarianism, uh, perhaps with a vision of freedom, of a reordered society. Some of these concerns may properly be part of First Amendment analysis. Some may not. But the constitutional inquiry, whatever it is, cannot be reduced to uh, cost-benefit analysis or even, I don't think, fair use analysis. What we need, of course, is an understanding of what the freedom of speech is about if it's not about fair speech or, or cost-effective speech. And a very characteristic answer to this question is, well, it's about democracy. And I take this to be one of the chief thrusts of the uh, argument in Yochai's uh, uh, excellent paper. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the democracy uh, part of Yochai's paper received a subtle treatment. They're weaving it together with considerations of, of autonomy. I have myself uh, always felt that the democracy-centered accounts of, 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 the free, uh, of, of the freedom of speech are not adequate and not sufficient. Why? Because they leave out something fundamental, the place of art and creativity, which are central to our concerns here when we think about copyright. I think uh, it's arguable, of course, but I don't think a democracy-centered account is the right place to start if you're interested in the freedom of the human imagination. And I think that is the right starting point. The absolute inability of government under our Constitution to make it illegal for a person to dare to explore a thought, a feeling, an image. To explore any thought, any feeling, any image. The fundamental principle of the First Amendment here is no censorship of the human imagination. I'm not going to try to elaborate on the key ideas here of censorship, imagination, and exploration, which uh, is what you'd have to do to work this out. But I do think that they uh, can help explain the, po the proper place and limits of copyright. They won't, they won't kill copyright. They may be more sympathetic to copyright than many of you would like to be, but they should alter copyright. I think they would call into question the entire concept of exclusive rights protection for derivative works. When did this happen? Why did it happen? Can it survive the interrogation of copyright before the, the First Amendment? I think these considerations will point to a regime of nearly no injunctions, liability rules, as many people have put it, or compulsory licenses. I myself do not think there is any First Amendment reason why the author or publisher of The Wind Ungone should not share profits with the Mitchell estate. That's, that's my view. No, no First Amendment reason against sharing profits. But there is a First Amendment reason why government cannot give any private party a censorship right over the manipulation of the symbols and language that our culture throws out to us. Symbols such as the word Olympics, to, to cite a case that Jamie Boyle has discussed, uh, to refer to a case, or the character of Scarlett O'Hara. The freedom of human imagination, I believe, is an idea which underlies a number of the presentations here. I think it's, it's, it's directly behind David Lang's paper from yesterday, if I'm reading it right, I think it's behind some of Larry Lessig's remarks about free culture uh, earlier today. I believe that it does draw on the tradition of law and, 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 and uh, the internal reasonings of American constitutional law that, uh, that, that Jeff Powell was uh, referring to. And I think that uh, it might offer some uh, help to the project that, that you all are uh, engaged in. Thank you, Jeb. And the final uh, presentation will be made by Duke Professor uh, William Van Ostein. <coughs> um, it's almost a sure sign that um, Jed and Jeff and I come out of the older field of constitutional law and not the newer one of invention and copyright <coughs> because we have no PowerPoint and laptop and, uh, <laughs> and a supplement to eat it. Um, in fact, I'm almost proof now of one of the observations that uh, Jed offered, that some performances are so superb they mute anything that one was otherwise inclined to say. 
it was very powerful and very well done. Um, and I agree with both of my former colleagues and agree with our main presenter as well. The main presenter, if you haven't read his paper, it's an elegant, powerful, and well-rounded work. <coughs> but even as Jefferson Powell did point out, and I agree entirely with him, uh, there's such ambiguity and space among various views of autonomy and democracy that one can nod acquiescently as the paper goes along and uh, not until a uh, concrete illustration appears in the paper are you given some pause to think about it uh, very seriously. Uh, Rubenfeld's remarks were nice in following it up um, and in trying to give some kind of, of the substance and point to the First Amendment. Uh, I want to offer very limited observations, and I'll use as a point of departure something not in my original notes at all. It was rather, as I saw you nod along, with Jed's suggestion that in the, uh, in the uh, recent Gone with the Wind litigation, it would seem to be an about an appropriate First Amendment balance insofar as some degree of royalty ought to be shared with the Mitchell estate in fair recompense for whatever significant degree of borrowing can thereby be attributed and yet by no means strip the public and others of the opportunity to see this quote derivative and highly critical product. Uh, that seems very sensible to me. Um, it's, it, it's interesting that that's a solution that's already been hit upon, and it reports one of the tensions, as I'm sure most of you in this room already know, inside the current Copyright Act itself. Um, I got interested in this subject beginning about 25 years ago by the accident of sitting in on a colleague's course on copyright that I never sat in on, even though I'd been teaching constitutional law with the First Amendment component for four or five years. And I was puzzled because the case that was then being discussed in class was a case uh, called Le Time Life Incorporated versus Geis. It had to do with the Zapruder film taken from a novel in 1963. And it was a very interesting discussion, but I was listening to the discussion and reading the clause and thinking about the First Amendment. And, uh, and uh, I was wondering, I don't understand how this qualifies. That is to say, Mr. Zapruder was not an artist. He's not Maplethorpe. He doesn't pose this. There's not fine shading. There's no skill. There's no genius. There's n nothing inspiration. No even hard work that went into this thing. Right. But there he was. Indeed, he had sold it for $150,000, all copyright to Time Life. And they, in command then of the whole fee, as it were, the fee simple ownership of that film, was using it then to suppress a book that was then borrowing copiously after life had said, no, you may not use these pictures. They're in our control now. Uh, it's a, a very interesting case, as it were. And these days, you could see it easily within uh, Jed's presentation of the First Amendment concern, the very idea that the images of the Kennedy assassination, no other of which would provide anyone any good impression as to whether there might have been a second gunman or what the exit path was of the precise bullet. No other, quote, expression of the event having been captured by anyone else, and no one else being able to reel time backward to take their own picture. Right. Then in terms of meeting public interest, if not allaying a certain degree of public panic, could hardly be done without taking the whole thing. Indeed, if you thought the example given by Jed of fuck the draft was good, this one better in that sense of some kind of, of use. What's interesting about the case is that the court um, upheld the use for the publisher and called it a fair use. Very interesting. They observed along the way, however, that in part what convinced them that it was a fair use, that the book publisher, the Thompson Company, offered to turn over all profit from sale of the book to Time Life so that they would get the entire profit stream from the appearance of the film clip in their particular work. This is a very interesting case because uh, the then most outstanding and probably in retrospect remaining the principal um, scholar in copyright law in this country, Mel Nimmer, uh, was interested in that case and, and that's what got me interested later when he wrote his seminal essays on does the First Amendment restrict the copyright clause. At the time it was a, a novel idea. And this was a case, actually, Professor Nimmer criticized, criticized on the basis that 
he could not bring it in within, within the conventional understanding of the fair use as that is outlined within the statute. Uh, but that he could understand it on First Amendment grounds. And it was a very interesting schizophrenia for Mel Nimmer. That's, a, that's what set up his interest in this field, that in terms of a very excellent professional copyright lawyer, as he went through the various steps, whether it was sufficiently original, it was, it did have the enough components of originality as to where he placed the camera, what the camera was, the angle at which it was used, the number of frames, and so on. You know, there are those modest elements of adequate creativity as to bring it within the protective act of Congress. Right? And he went right down the line and could not locate any combination under the fair use provisions as they then stood to account for the result. And thus far, he suggested, therefore, not that the case was badly decided, but just wrongly decided, on the wrong ground, on the wrong ground. Very interesting. The gap, therefore, between even the most, what, Generous use of the Copyright Act, they say the most generous con construction of its fair use provisions. In his view, they ought not be tortured even in the interest of bringing this excellent case within their boundary line. And having said that, P.S., maybe then the copyright law, as properly applied by the court, is invalid as applied in this instance because of something that emanates out of the First Amendment itself. It may be the burden of the party who so claims to show that that is the case, in short, that the freedom of the press, to which Mr. Powell observed, indeed, the phrase, the freedom of the press is not self-defining, and it's by no means clear that the freedom of the press is that freedom of any person who owns one to take the book that first appears in the bookstore, photograph it, and run off copies and undersell the author. That's a strange freedom of the press, but there must be something. But that was the origin of my own, own interest. It was Mel Nimmer's uncertainty and his inability to torture the copyright statute in its most permissive form to do the work that nonetheless seemed inevitable and important at the time. Now, I th that reports a lot of tension. Um, the case that, that interested me most as of three years ago in this overlapping field was A. Cuff Rose, the Pretty Woman case. And I, and I have a case book on the First Amendment, not a case book on the copyright law. A. Cuff Rose is one of the very few cases that's not decided on constitutional grounds that I include in this case book that's only on the First Amendment. You said, well, that seems rather frivolous. Why don't you leave it to Stephen Lang and your more learned colleagues? Uh, the reason is this, that if you took out the language from David Souter's opinion, that refers to the fair use provisions of the Copyright Act, you struck them out entirely. Or as an exercise in provisional imagination, you removed the language from the Copyright Act that made David Souter's aggressive use of that language even plausible. You might still be composing an opinion which would read almost verbatim the same as that which he wrote. And you would borrow it from case law that is pure First Amendment case law, not involving copyright at all. You would do involving cases such as Cohen versus the people of California, as a matter of fact. And that interests me. And that brings me to perhaps the only plausible contribution with a drink of water <laughs> that I would like to try to make, which is to dispel what I think is still a continuing confusion as we struggle over these overlapping problems. And for me, the confusion is this. It is, it's uh, in trying to put our concerns um, that are First Amendment concerns uh, inside the copyright clause itself. They say it's the difference between external limitations and interior limitations. What do I mean by that? Well. Insofar as you're quote, the outsider and have a strong First Amendment view that therefore wants to constrain the use of copyright as narrowly as can be done, it makes only sense, even as I've seen in many writings and including, not all, but part of the work of, of Larry Lessig here, to try to read the copyright clause with a strict construction and not a generous construction. And so by that reading, confine it fairly narrowly driven by the desire to do so, frankly, from a feeling about the First Amendment in the background. And if we did that, indeed, we could give it a very limited feel. I'll just do it 
teasingly on, in one or two examples, I'm sorry it's not on the board again, perhaps you all have memorized it from your professional interest. But it does say to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive rights to the respective writings and discoveries. Great. If we applied a rule of strict construction, then indeed we could say you may secure to the author or the inventor, but not to his assign or heir or anyone else, period. That's a plausible, literal reading. And if one were a strict constructionist and then teasingly wanted to be a juvenile Hugo Black, one would say, well, that's what they said. And if they wanted to include heirs and assigns, the flexibility of the language and the dictionaries of the era and the obvious alternatives were there. And I'm not going to read it in, partly because I'm thinking about the First Amendment. And then we wouldn't even worry very much about limited times, would we? <laughs> ah. well, it takes care of itself. That's right. And accordingly to writings and discoveries. You say, well, writings are not <coughs> other things. And they're certainly not derivatives, you would say. And thus you could, and thus the tendency is, and in the, even in this Eldred case, this recent one that almost all agree with the current extension now to life and 70 years, is put beyond the pale. What makes me want to talk to you about this matter is that most of the work in argument is thought to be done by, well, life and 70 years is just not a limited time. After all, it started out 14 years once renewable, did it not? And limited even then to a very few number of kinds of things, maps and a few other things. Right. And then it got longer, and then it got longer. And now we've leaped it up right, till it's a plausible 120 years. And then you put 120 years alongside this authors and inventors. This is, this is the end. I'm going to persuade the Circuit Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia that when Congress provides for this duration, it is not sanctioned by this clause. Fair enough. Limited time must be short of that. If not, why then, where will it end? Uh, one answer is, well, I don't know. But so far as those in Europe, at least within their systems, of course, they're not controlled by First Amendment. We'll come back to that. Think that given modern technology and everything else, this may be an appropriate period of time. I'll desist. My point is, is the one I've shared with you, that driven by First Amendment concerns, there's a premature and overwrought tendency to want to seek, in the language of the Copyright Clause, a kind of style of strict construction in order to domesticate the field and protect freedom of borrowing and, and variation and critique and all the rest that way, that way. But I want to suggest to you that you wouldn't do that if not driven by that concern. And that the copyright clause is, is free and clear of all First Amendment considerations at step one. They will come right back. The copyright clause is a federalism clause. It is a federalism clause in exactly the same sense as the neighboring power given to Congress in 1789 to, quote, regulate commerce among the several states is a federalism clause, and that is all it is. What does one mean by that? Well, I want to suggest to you that the problems are seen as of the era as of very much of the same cloth, as a matter of fact. Prior to the innovation of that power given to Congress to regulate commerce among the several states, then indeed commerce within the country at large would be subject to whatever diverse regimes were pleasing to each of the states severally. If they could not be coordinated or if they could not be preempted, it would just be chaos. Fair enough. When, therefore, you, you, you grant to Congress the power to regulate commerce among the several states, that's the problem you're dealing with. We're not confused when we come to that clause, as we tend to, and grant it as all language in the Constitution is appropriately granted a presumption of generous construction, not stringent construction, that we're doing any damage to potential First Amendment concerns. We're not at all confused. We do not, therefore, try to read the clause that best in Congress and authority to try to overrule or preempt the unruly chaos of conflicting state laws dealing with commerce, you see, in a narrow way so that that would simply maximize what is left over for states to do with as they want willy-nilly, no matter how disadvantaging to 
commerce that might be. So we come to the Commerce Clause with a presumption of generous construction. Even as Marshall said, words fit for a constitution as distinct from a statute or administrative regulation at least should come to this court with a heavy presumption of generous construction, for this is a constitution meant to endure for ages to come, not easily amended, and therefore to be treated as adaptable to altered circumstances as they may happen. Stop. That's the case. Congress may then adopt a statute well within that power. It may be a statute that forbids the interstate commercial carriage of pork bellies. Some of us may resent that law. We're fond of pork bellies. Too bad for us, but it's clearly within the four corners of the power, and since we're not able to discover an outside boundary, the Congress shall make no law restricting the shipment of pork bellies. <coughs> We're finished. If, on the other hand, the statute it makes is one that forbids the interstate shipment of books for sale, it's well within the power. And we're not yet sure, you and I, whether that statute now interdicting interstate commercial commerce in books necessarily offends the First Amendment. We don't know yet. That we will not know until we have a notion as to what the First Amendment assures book publishers of a right to do. Fair enough? If we begin our argument anew and turn to that separate outside restraint, then it will not take us long, I think, to discover that even anciently, right, generously construed, the freedom of the press contemplated a capacity right, to sell what came from the press, newspapers, pamphlets, in books, right, and freely circulate them as it was. So when by the crossover, we had begun to make our case. Now, the copyright clause, in my opinion, is of the same thing. You must put yourself back in time. The power given to Congress to regulate commerce among the several states really doesn't reach lots that is left over. It doesn't reach commerce even, quote, purely internal to each state. At least that was the course early view. And it certainly wouldn't, would not reach, generally speaking. The variety among state laws differently dealing with authors' rights, whether these are common law, property rights, or statutory rights. Are you with me? We may suppose, for instance, and I propose this to you as a hypothetical, a North Carolina statute. This is what it will look like. No one shall, within 120 years of its publication, make any copy or distribute or sell any copy of an author's original work in whole or in any part absent written permission or license granted by the author, his assigns, or his heirs. That's just my hypothetical statute. Right. Now, first, we eliminate the First Amendment. It's not there yet. It's not in the picture. Fair enough. Second, take away the power in Congress to preempt the field. Third, leave intact its power to regulate commerce among the several states. If you take those steps, which are the steps that are with us as of 1789, there's nothing to reproach this act by the North Carolina legislature. Nothing at all. Another state may have it for 10 years, another for 12 days, another not including a sign. Who cares? It is chaos from the point of view of having any interest in, in inventors and writers. You must indeed at least invest in the national government a generous power to preempt state laws in this area. Now, how wide is this area? That's the second question. How wide ought it appropriately be for the issue is only one of preemption of state laws, not the First Amendment. Are you with me? All right, I'm, I'm, I'm virtually at the end. My point then is, is a, a suggestion. The tendency in this area, and it's understandable, the court reflected. Lawyers reflected, scholars reflected, is that the copyright clause is a qualifier on the First Amendment. It's a kind of take back. It's a restriction of the First Amendment because it's directed to writings and things of that kind. It is not. It's a federalism clause only. And as such, it is appropriate to give it a generous construction in terms of the power of Congress to do these things, whether it's defining a limited time in the first step or who is an author or a writer, and whether it may include derivatives or not. I don't find that breathtaking, but it is totally inconclusive of any First Amendment consideration. That comes in from the outside, and whether in every particular case it may say, no, not an injunction here, maybe in some other case. 
Not a criminal sanction here, maybe in some other cases. Not in this particular use that's being made, maybe in many other uses. We not need now worry about that. Those are all the First Amendment problems. And with regard to those, Rubenfeld has spoken well, and I've spoken much too long. <laughs> So um, I want to take the prerogative of the moderator to ask the first question. Sorry. Okay, I'm not going to be surprised when Jed and Jeff jump up in the middle of my question, but it won't be a three-minute question. <laughs> um, and so this, uh, I, I particularly want to point to what uh, Bill has just said at the end. I mean, for those of you who are not in constitutional law, you should understand this man has made a career in explaining to us what Article I, Section 8 means, and in particular parts of Article I, Section 8, in ways that have surprised and educated constitutional lawyers from the very beginning. My first experience of this was the Necessary and Proper Clause, so I take this effort at helping us understand what Article I, Section 8, Clause 8, the copyright and patent clause means, to be an extremely important contribution that we should take seriously. And it's an interesting contrast to the rest of the conversation. Uh, if Yochai was criticized for being out about um, uh, democracy and autonomy as the driving forces, I guess we could equally make a criticism against the two First Amendment lawyers, which would be of the form, isn't the place to look for the public domain or the, constitutional, the constitutionalization of the public domain, at least in part, at the copyright clause. Um, now, the answer that I think Bill has given in the end is no, it's not. <laughs> that it was about federalism and just about empowering Congress. But I want to push on that a little bit because the copyright clause is not written the way any copyright clause could have been written. It doesn't say Congress has the power to pass copyrights. It doesn't even say Congress has the power to enact statutes to protect copyrights for limited times. As the conservative Judge Santel said in his vicious dissent in the Eldred case, the power that Congress has is the power to promote progress for limited times by, by granting these exclusive rights. But that's the particular power. Now, the argument wouldn't necessarily be, let's read that in a narrow way. Let's read that in the broadest way you want. Let's read that expansively and embrace those types of grants that actually promote progress. The argument then, in the particular context of the Eldred case, is not that 70 years is too much, but 60 years is not too much. It's that when you extend the terms for already existing works, as Judge Santel said quite forcefully in dissent, you're not promoting the progress of anything except the profits of those who happen to own the copyrights of those particular works. So the question, I guess, for you directly, Bill, then is then, then help us understand if you took seriously the full of this clause, sure. what more than federalism might be in there? Yeah. Well, oh, I like that example, but it may be that that part of the case can be handled in that way. If you, if you if I understood you correctly, that insofar as some, some works have already been brought into existence, and insofar as they were, under the stimulus of having so many years of exclusive profit, that time gone by, the extension as retrospectively applied, they've not yet passed into the public domain, to be sure, cannot possibly furnish any incentive in that regard. Uh, I, I would respect that argument and say, to the extent that that is well-reasoned, indeed, then the extension of the act as applied to those works falls outside the clause. But as to those that have not yet been made, you see, then we're back where we were before. And then we may have to turn to some consideration as to those. As it were. That's possible. I don't, I don't, I should just say, gee, I handled it, wasn't that neat. <laughs> there, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to lose the point I was trying to share with you, because it's very interesting that because of the manner in which the Supreme Court has lavishly construed the power to regulate commerce among the several states and with foreign nations, you could pick this up through the back door and say, well, that may be so, Mr. Leffy, that it doesn't quite fit the authorization of the copyright clause. But everybody knows now that the power to regulate commerce is very, very elaborate. It's, it's what was picked up in the 19th century, wasn't it? The copyright clause did not authorized trademark protection at the national level. You recall? Indeed, the first national legislation on trademarks was held 
unconstitutional, not under the First Amendment, but not qualifying, and the Commerce Clause not being deemed generous enough itself. Right? Now, of course, because of the manner in which the Commerce Clause is lavishly construed, Congress can protect copyright to such an extent that David Nimmer and others uh, have said, well, who cares about copyright? Because evidently, Congress can do under the commerce power many of the same things and to an egregiously greater degree for its power to set the rules for commerce are not for limited time, but forever. You see it? Forever. Which is really an interesting paradox. So uh, that's my answer. I'm not saying that there are no, that, there's, that anything goes under the copyright clause. I am saying only that I'm not disposed, as others are, to read it stringently, cripplingly, hostilely, in view of its federalism function, as it were, but that's completely free and clear of one's First Amendment mm -hmm. concern. Mm -hmm. They can all rush in ferociously from the outside, just as my colleagues have rushed into the outside themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so I'll just say we won't talk about the commerce, but uh, even embracing it lovingly, the copyright clause, and with the spirit of attempting to give it its fullest and greatest meaning, the government hasn't yet argued that the commerce clause permits it to do anything that the copyright clause doesn't. And I think if it does argue that, it will lose. <coughs> At least that. Um, yes, um, I, A lot of people in this room have stated or implied that the purpose of intellectual property protection is to promote the progress of science and intellect. Um, and that when we assess a potential IP rule, the question is how well does it fulfill that constitutional goal? Does it promote the progress? Is a particular proposed fair use rule uh, properly calculated to achieve that, again, constitutionally mandated end? And it seems like potentially this, this proper calculation that we're seeking after might be something kind of arcane and complicated like tax code you know, allocating access and incentives and liability rules and, and, and so forth. Um, ag against this sort of theme that comes up in, in a lot of people's writing, several participants in this conference have also suggested that a relevant consideration is what normal people think. Um, so David Lang has suggested that we should look to what the relevant community thinks is fair. Jessica Littman has suggested that a rule might not be legitimate if the ordinary person laughs at it and thinks that it can't possibly be law. Um, Yochai Bankler, as parsed by Jamie, um, suggests that the most Sorry. important question might be whether, am I doing that? No, no. Sorry. There are, lots of, there are lots of these mics, and <laughs> if you, uh... <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll hold back. Um, might be whether lay people would know that a particular piece of information is available for use. So I guess what I wanted to ask <coughs> the panel is about the intersection of those two considerations, this sort of populist perspective of how IP ought to work versus this careful constitutional <laughs> calculation. Um, <coughs> no, it's just there's uh, lots of interesting things to think about. Um, different conversations need to happen in different communities that have the power to affect the way we use culture and the way we use information and produce it. Um, it is the case that when one speaks to those who have particular sets of powers to structure that relationship, one needs to use the internal professional discourse and the sometimes complex and obscure mechanisms of persuasion and justification within that group uh, in order to reach an outcome that one believes is right. Um, that ought not be confused with thinking about what ought to be right. Uh, and so if what you care about is how people interact with the information and cultural environment in which they live, you need to understand the rules in terms that refer, refer to how people actually live in their information environment, how they interact with it, and that needs to define the set of relationships 
that you should be aiming for. Then there's a different role of translating that outcome, normatively justified, into a set of arguments that will carry weight with those who can affect the institutional structure to achieve that goal. And judges are one such group, and legislators are another group, and each of these groups has a different set of mechanisms for justifying action for it. And you need to master those and make the argument within those. And the only thing is not to obscure one as something that is not what one is doing. One needs to be, I think, very crisp and very clear about what drives one normatively. And then one needs to be very clear about why it is that I'm making this argument in this context, in this structure, because I'm speaking to these people whose hands is on this particular lever of power. OK. Uh, Pam? I think one of the reasons that, uh, that many of us in the intellectual property field uh, think that there actually may be more substance uh, and more limitation on Congress's power uh, in respect of Article I, Section 8 Clause A has to do with, uh, with a kind of historical backdrop to the American <coughs> Constitution in respect of intellectual property rights. So there was a period of time in which the, the, the royalty were giving out patents mm. to anybody for anything, and the statute of monopoly limited that to a limited time for true inventors, and that, that there's something about that historical experience being antagonistic to those kind of monopolies unless it was going to produce this kind of new innovation that was important and that was, in fact, imported into that part of the clause. And I <coughs> personally believe that there also is a similar history on the copyright side, yeah. that the, sort of the, the pre-statute of Anne copyright regime was, in fact, a regime of censorship. It was where the rights were perpetual, the rights were in the publisher, not in the author, and the statute of Anne uh, turned that around and said, only to authors, only for limited times, and only to encourage learning, and that those, those aspects of that historical experience which happened in the early part of the of the 18th century, I think, were imported into uh, Article One, Section Eight, Clause Eight, and so there actually, I think, is more historical substance to it. So I don't agree with your interpretation that it's only about federalism. I think it's partly about federalism, and it was partly about federalism because you had states having separate copyright and, and patent rules, and that was a bad thing. Uh, but I think actually that historical backdrop is really important for informing what it what it means. Now that isn't to say that, that you can't have some generosity uh, still within it, but I think that there are some constraints owing to history that actually are part of the reason that those uh, that the, those words were used. Right, we have a lot of hands up, but Jimmy, what the, what's the time that we've we got? We really have to stop in a couple of minutes, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, well, I would have, like to comment on that. Actually, I like. I'm, I'm grateful for your emendations, actually, particularly bearing in mind that the clause itself uh, comes before the enactment of the First Amendment. Um, and so the requirement of originality and authorship um, is certainly connected with what you say, and the court has pretty well required that. It's reflected even in the trademark cases. So I don't, I don't mean to neglect the fact that you can make sensible arguments of that kind inside the clause, that's to be sure. But I do insist that it's still primarily a federalism clause in, in that regard, bearing in mind see that as of that date, there's neither First Amendment against Congress, so you would be drafting that clause even as a nationalist power, federalism clause, with some degree of boundary and modesty. But that nothing in the First Amendment is going to apply to the states at all. They're, they're totally unaffected, other than by a preemptive authority of Congress, whether it's under the commerce power or the copyright power, to do what they damn well want with regard to things left over from those clauses. They say nothing in the Bill of Rights affects the states in this area until the 14th Amendment. Is that, you, are you with me? Not until, and not even then, until 50 years after the fact, the Supreme Court begins to read into the liberty due process component of the 14th Amendment, a set of constraints <coughs> applicable to the states, equivalent to those the First Amendment was deemed to enact on, on Congress. So I would still want to maintain that it is primarily a federalism provision to ensure the possible uniformity and fair treatment in these important areas of stimulating creativity and advancing science and the, and the, the uh, useful arts. 
in that regard. And in that regard, the provisions are to be read ungrudgingly. Okay, in the spirit of a couple minutes, we, um, David, you had a question? Uh, Bill, I want to just ask two things. Uh, one is, in, in dealing with the Clause 8 as a federalism clause in the way that you've done it, it does seem to me hard to do it as unguarded as you have, taking into account what the court said in Graham against John Deere. I mean, that, that's one problem I have in, in hearing you say that it's just another Section 8 federalism clause. And, and it also seems to me, though, I, I don't have, as you do, copies of the Constitution at hand, and I may be misremembering that, but it strikes me that unlike the other uh, clauses in Section 8, yeah. mm -hmm. Clause 8 is the only one that begins with a statement of what, in fact, the court later construes as kind of limiting purpose. Those things seem to me, taken together and adding to them what Pam has said, yeah. uh, to make this something other than, more than, uh, in addition to, well, uh, just a federalism. Again, I, we're not really at odds. I, but I'm sorry if you, if you think we are. Uh, the cautionary language is there, and for very much the reasons I think that, it, that you've shared and correctly recall. That having been said, however, I think they verge on being a political question, that is to say, in terms of how the court can help to, help to apply them in the policy of law sense. I'll try to give you a corresponding example. Earlier on in Article 1, Section 8, the first list of powers, the power to levy taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, comma, to pay the debts of the United States, provide for the, uh, provide for the common defense, and promote the general welfare. That's a boundary clause. You hear it? So unless taxes are being levied to serve one of these purposes, then they are not authorized by this clause. Uh, that is its meaning, and that's, I think, its intention. The question will then arise with regard to a certain spending measure undertaken by Congress. Can this fairly be deemed in behalf of the general welfare or does this seem as though some special interest group has been able to muscle through a bill in Congress for its advantage? There's a certain parallel run. I assure you, the court itself has treated the language, the general welfare, as virtually non-justiciable. They don't call it non-justiciable, but Rehnquist, in a proper opinion, said that, that uh, we must yield uh, virtually the entire question to Congress. If a majority of both houses and the signature of the president attest to their satisfaction that this manner of spending the money, whether it's worth the named bailout company or not, is conducive to the general welfare, we as judges cannot appropriately second guess that, though we may have our doubts. Now, I'm not, I don't mean to go anywhere with this, except to show you the parallel nature of it if you're going to try to invoke that preambular clause. There are half a dozen other clauses. I'll remind you of one other just because it's so wonderfully controversial as to what it means. There is one other clause in the Constitution that is quite similar to the copyright clause in that it's preceded preambularly, and what no one knows how it works. And this is what it says. A well-regulated militia, comma, <laughs> being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people ah, to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. That's very interesting. What does it mean? <laughs> we'll take that some up some other day. But 